the act of love. All power to the people. I said the thief is the power that ain't for action, the ain't be because now it's bound to get shot. See the eight is for heart and the eat for each set. The all woman down at the end to be say, who am I a panther? Who am I a panther? What I got, I got soul. What I got, I got love. What I got, I got pride. What I wanna be free. Raise your hands in the air. Be like me. Who am I, man? Who am I, man? What I got, I got soul. What I got, I got love. What I got, I got pride. What I want to be free. Raise your hands in the air. Be like me. See the pride in the parents. He glows. He's gonna look great. Stop playing pops with the clothes. He's gonna express Can you see the pride in the Never just say young yeah, all his own. He must grow regardless of the fact that strange is strong. He the pride of the unified one. The flower blooms in the village. Now shine the day of the I'll shine mm-hmm. like the sun. Shine down like the sun. Shine bright like the sun. When you like like the sun. He is the power that ain't for action. The ain't he because now it's time to get it done. See the eight is for all and the e for e flat. The all woman down at the end to reflect. Who am I? Who am I? What I got, I got soul. What I got, I got love. What I got, I got pride. What I want to be free. Reach your hands. Be ready, Captain. Be my eight. Who am I? Who am I? What I got, I got soul. What I got, I got love. What I got, I got pride. What I want to be free. Raise your hands in the air. Be like me. Some is dedicated to all those who live and die for the struggle. Family, children of the Panthers. Hey, all power to the people, man. All power to the people. How you doing, comrade? All power to the people. Doing? All power. All power. All power to the people. Hey, man. It's beautiful to be back here. We're going to jump right into it. Um, Each week, students will be assigned. Not, let me start that over. Ah, uh, rewind. Welcome to Assange Core Political Education Class. This is week seven. We are the way at week seven. Um, Next week, I'm going to give a review of what we've done so far. But um, each week, students will be assigned reading and video to study. And well, patience, this stuff is on the screen again. How do I get rid of this stuff on the screen? Click on the two button and press high. I moved, I, moved, I moved it, but this one is still there. Each week, students will be assigned reading and video to study and will convene once a week to discuss the material, interpret and break down core concepts, questions, and answers, and to prepare for next week's study materials. Remember that taking notes can be really beneficial, even audio ones, and don't be afraid to ask for help. We all in this together. Each week, you're encouraged to bring the following. Posts from the material, questions you have, your interpretation of the material, core concept, revolutionary spirit. Comrades, our studies this week will focus on the movie, documentary, documentary assigned last week, Panther and Huey. We'll go over a couple of questions on the material and then move on to Fred Hampton's speech. It's a class struggle, God damn it. You know what, I'm a, I don't, who are, I hope, I hope we watch the movie out there. Did, did anybody watch the, um, the movie last week? All power to the people. I watched it a hundred times, but not last week. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know what? I'm gonna give. Why am I hearing the echo? I'm gonna give a um, what you call it? I'm gonna give. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play this video right here, just the first couple of minutes, so we could get an understanding what the um what the movie was about. If you didn't watch it, I'm gonna just let like the beginning play, because okay. basically. Basically, what they talk about in the beginning, like basically what the movie is going to be about.
that is nothing more dangerous than to build a society with a large segment of people in that society who feel that they have no stake in it, who feel that they have nothing to lose. People who have stake in that society protect that society, but when they don't have it, they unconsciously want to destroy it. That's what the that's what the movie was about. The movie was about that era, how the Black Panther Party came about, and the struggles and the things that they went through, trying to put the party together, and everything that happened to them as them getting the party together. So that's basically what the um the movie was about. And this these questions that you see on the screen are what we're supposed to talk about if we watch the movie. Hey, yo, but, but I know, man, people don't be watching the movie. People don't be doing their homework, and it's like. And that's another thing I want to talk about this week. That we got to take this seriously. We got to take what we're doing seriously. We have to watch this movie so we could be able to, to talk about this stuff. Like right now, I want to ask the first question. What were some of the difficulties faced by the Black Panther Party? I want to throw that out there because right now we're supposed to be having a discussion. And I'm throwing it out there. Chairman, this ain't for you, Chairman. This oh, is okay. this I'll yeah, to the yeah, people. Yeah, this ain't for you. Now, it's for everybody out there that's in the class that saw the movie. If you saw it, if you saw it, tell me like what what were some of the difficulties they faced? Anybody? Infiltration. Oh, sorry. I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> no, you don't have. Well, you good. I told anybody to answer. You said infiltrate. Inf Go ahead, talk to me. Tell me more. I always thought that it was really interesting that um, a lot of the conversations that I have with other comrades and spaces for years now, they, they don't really get down deep with the infiltration that happened. I mean, we know about the infiltration with Huey uh, Newton and stuff like that. And they only know now because of the more recent movies, right? Uh -huh. But I mean, it's still, it's still taken for granted what infiltration looks like. Also because there wasn't cell phones and stuff like that back then. So I feel like there, there's been some change with how we interpret infiltration. Infiltration is, you know, that manufactured just unity I'm always talking about too. And so it's a way to separate the people. And that was one of the difficulties I think the Black Panther Party was facing at that time. All power, all power to the people. All power to the people. All power to the people. Um, anybody else got something? I was pretty much gonna say the same thing. Uh, like it's hard to know who to trust in these types of organizations type shit, you know what I mean? Like, cause you never know who's working with, you know, the police basically. Nah, all power. You're yeah, answering the second one too. How did this affect um, their organizer? Cause if you can't trust the person you're working with, it's gonna be, it'll be difficult, it's hard. Felix, I have hand up. Go ahead, Felix. Oh no, I just spoke, my bad. I, I didn't oh. wait. <laughs> you good, you good, Felix. Nah, but that's, that was some of, some of the difficulties, man. Not, I'm gonna be candid, man. It, 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 um, 
Hey, Chaka, you saw the you saw the video a couple of times, right? The movie a couple of times, right? Yeah, power to the people. Yes, I did. Yo, you saw all those celebrities in there? Yes, I did. Yo, those were like the power. Like, if you haven't seen this movie, you should go back and see it. But this is like, um, what's her name? What's her name? Angela Bassett. She played Malcolm X's wife, right? Yeah. And her husband played Bobby Seale, right? Yeah. Hey, how long, when this movie come out, do you know, um, Chairman? 95. 95. We're in 2023. Any of those people put any institutions together? Nope. Not that I know of. Not that I None? know of. Yo, this movie, yo, if you remember Dwayne Wayne, yo, what's his name was even in there? What's his name from Friday? Yeah, the little... Ezel. Yeah. Ezel was in there. That, that's the bad guy from Friday. I mean, the um, now he was the bad guy in the, in the um in the movie, but he the dude from Friday that was shitting that Smokey told like, "What you doing back there, Ezel?" No, no, no. Smokey was shitting, and Ezel told on him. But yeah, but but all these people, I'm saying like all these people were in the movie. All this, um, what would you call them? Famous black actors, and and they know people be saying like these people don't know our condition, what we're going through. Like they be giving them excuses. But these people know. And like they were in there, they were acting it, they were saying this stuff. They were saying everything that we be saying, Chairman. Like they like they were quoting this stuff, like they went to the political classes, they understand this stuff. But I don't see not one institution that any of these people have built. They have done nothing, man. Yo, that, like I'm saying that to say, yo, I don't mess with celebrities. I think celebrities are problematic. They are cancer to our community, to, to our people. Celebrities are very dangerous. They work against our interests. And when I put that movie on, because I never saw it before, all power, you know, all power chairman, if I put it on, I never saw this movie before. I mean, and I don't know how I didn't see it if all these people were in it. What's his name? The, 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 the um, guys in every hood movie. Bo Bokeem, yeah. Bokeem something. Who know, who know his name? Bokeem something, man. What was he in? He was in Jason Lyrics. Hey, hey, chairman, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nah, but all these people, like that's one thing that that's the first thing that stood out to me when I was watching. Like all these people. Go ahead, Nick. You got saying Nick. Um, yeah, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Nick. Okay, cool, because I'm out in the country. Um uh I if it's a movie that was like the 99 with all the all started cast, I would say this. I did watch that movie last time I was in this class. Um, but one of the problems I'll say is like rapid growth. And I think I'm getting this from a documentary, moreover, but it was rapid growth without really like setting a true foundation. If you understand what I'm saying, like you're inviting everybody in, but you're not really setting a actual, you know, actual, you know, no, no. foundation. I, got, I understand you, Nick. Nah, I'm following you. I got exactly. Okay. What okay. So it's like you, like it's like it's good that you're having a lot of people come in. Great. But and yes, people are taking the classes, but at the same time, it's like. With that, when you have the leaders to go, it's almost like, well, what was it all for, in a sense? So you have rapid growth without actual foundation, you know, foundational, you know, input. And of course, you have Cointel Pro. And just to piggyback what you said about the celebrities, that's very understandable. But we also have to remember them people are only, you know, it's only self-interested. So as much as we like, you know, certain people and stuff like that. They're still out there because a lot of black celebrities will not say anything pro, you know, proletariat anything. Even though some of them like deep down believe in it, but because their managers and how everything's gonna look in that bag, you know, that that's that's the main reason why, you know, I understand why a lot of people say I don't trust celebrities and stuff like that. But but back to the original question, like, um, it, it was just, it was a such a fast paced growth without any foundation. And then even you have certain leave, uh, uh, certain leaders like what is Eldridge, Eldridge Cleaver, he wound up running in, or, or running for somebody, you know, for the Republican Party or giving some money to the Republican Party or something like that. Clearly going against all the interests that he ever fought for in his younger days, you know. So not only you have that, you have people, you know, switching up, you know, because they become self-interested over time. So that was that's 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 what I want to say from. Him. Nah, outstanding. No, no, no. All power, all power. Yeah, all power. Yeah, I peeped that too, comrade. I peeped it too. But but yeah, but 
that's kind of the same stuff that we struggle with now. We struggle with that. I'm talking about like right now in real time, when you when you put an organization together, it's hard, man. It's hard to tell people that they have to unlearn everything that they've already learned. But but it's it's necessary. I mean that that everybody got to go through those classes. They got to be vetted. You got to be vetted. And like some people may feel some type of way. They're gonna feel like you're trying to shun them. But you can't you can't really do none of this work unless you go through these political political education classes. Because we all got to be working from the same from the same space, the same mindset, the same political philosophies. And it, it's hard, man, but we got to do it. You got to do the work. Yo, real talk, in how we doing it in our in our party over here, you can't join or you can't be an official member if you haven't gone through these classes and understand what our political line is. Because they bring a lot of confusions if people don't know. I mean, but, but but like I said, like you said, yo, you hit it right on the button. Anybody else got something? You don't have to put your hand up. You could just you could just chime in if you want to. I mean, but um, the last one, the last question is how did they attempt to overcome these differences? That's the last one. Anybody got anything on that? I guess I do. I I, I was going to introduce myself. I was going to introduce myself as an addict named Johnny, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think my how they attempted to overcome these difficulties is uh, perseverance, <clears throat> steadfastness, and um, and the willing to risk it all. Um, you know, at, at some point, um, at some point, you have to, you know, only oh, I'm only saying this because I'm learning, right? At some point, you have to be willing to uh, tell the truth, regardless of what the risk is going to be. And uh, and there is definitely a balance in there. There's a there's a there's definitely a balance in there because like uh, the comrade was just saying, like every, everybody doesn't want to have to give up everything that we already have been indoctrinated with, or that we already learned. A lot of it is learned through our own experience because each one of us may have a slightly different walk in our lives. You know, we have different exposure, different experiences, and uh, and because of that that old way of life seem to be rewarding um with privilege to many that uh to some to, to 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 those who reap the benefits of the privilege uh that it's like why why change why would i let go of why would i let go of it oh wow and, uh, and it's it's honestly it's um uh, it takes a lot of perseverance and dedication and steadfastness uh to move forward because some of the ideology that uh, some of the people who still appreciate what we have now is fucking scary. Excuse my language. It's scary. Oh, wow. You know, oh, wow. people, people say, well, we'll you know, literally, you know, uh, mass genocide is what we really need. Like wow. th those are the people that I, that's the, that's the thinking, you know what I mean? I'm just saying that because that's what, that was the person's response. And I'm like, you know, uh, I do talk about pro proletariat stuff. It's difficult to because in the environment, a construction environment, we're supposed to be um, appreciative for what we have, right? Uh, and even in the union, at the same time, what's the point of the union if there's no democracy? Oh, what's wow. the point of the union? Seriously, what's the point of the union if there's all no democracy? power? All power. Um, so I, I just my uh, my family came here from New York in the 60s, in the late 60s, my grandparents had already came to Seattle. My mom came here in 68 or 60, 67 or 68, no, 66, 65. Uh, and they they realized that what was needed, Socialist Workers Party realized that what was needed on the West Coast, because they sent my grandparents to Seattle first, but they realized what was needed on the West Coast was some representation, uh, revolutionary representation in the local painters union in san francisco because at the time local four was the biggest union in the country the biggest painters union in the country and uh and my 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 older brother's dad and my grandfather was were invited to invited into the fold of uh of the painters union to try and bring you know more radical uh ideals into it and i just got my mom just sent me this article uh they fuck they they um they put a hit out on the guy who was who was trying to lead it. Wow. You know, my grandfather or my 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 
older brother's dad, but they killed the guy who was, uh, I, I, maybe he was the president of the union at the time who was trying to push radical ideals. So like, we're really like in the, f I'm in the thick of it. Like I'm working under like a suspended platform underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, wow. So at any moment I could slip off, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in it, you know what I mean? I'm really in this thing trying to find a balance within this and that, you know what I mean? Seriously. I got you. I got you. And, and I don't, um, I don't allow, I, I don't allow myself to um, fall victim to the peer pressure. I can oh, at least I, I, I absolutely stand on that part of it. Oh, power. And then like, that's what we can do to attempt to overcome it. You have to try to withstand the, the pressure from all sides. Really, and that's basically that if you didn't see the movie, that's basically what it was about. It was about how they survived and how what they did and what how they did what they did to maintain themselves. That's what the movie is about, and it it tells that whole story. Like I, I hope even if, if you didn't see it, you should go back and see it. It's okay. It's a good movie. It got a whole bunch of stars in there. If you like stars, you like the movie. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, everybody in there. Like you'd be like, especially if you grew up like eighties and nineties, you know everybody in there. Yeah, but um, but look, we about what's to the name of the you. movie? You say what? What's the name of the movie? Um, Panther. Panther. Yeah, Panther. I Huey. appreciate. Pa it. Yeah, Panther Huey. But yeah, but um, we got we going on. We gonna go to the speech by um Fred Hampton. The speech. The speech is it's a class struggle. God damn it! Delivered by Fred Hampton, nineteen sixty nine. You ready, Chairman? All oh, power to the people. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to rap and educate. We're glad to throw out some more information and it's going to be hard to do. The system made a beautiful speech as far as I'm concerned. Shaka, the deputy minister of information that his job informed me, but I'm going to try to inform you also. One thing Shaka forgot to mention that brothers and sisters don't exactly the same we don't ask for we don't ask for any brother to get pregnant or anything. We don't ask no brothers to have no babies. So that's a little different also. After we go after we go through speaking, so those people can comrades meet their phones, please. Thank you. After we go through speaking, for those people, for those people of you who don't think you understand all the ideology exposed here so far and the ideologies that will espouse. We will have a question and answer period. Let me just say right here for the comrades, the reason why these synthesis are broken up is because this is how the speech was given. What are, what are the things that made Fred Hampton so eloquent and so reachable to the masses was his level of speech. Fred didn't speak in the vernacular of Harvard or the vernacular of Yale. Fred actually spoke in the vernacular of the masses, of the people on the street. So this speech right here is going to have a lot of breakups, but just bear with, uh, bear with me and we're going to get to the essence of what he's trying to convey. For those people who have their feelings hurt by niggas talking about guns, we'll have a cry in after the question and answer period. I apologize for that. <laughs> and for those white people that are here to show some type of overwhelming manifestation of guilt syndromes and want people to cry out that they love them, after the cry in, if we have time, we allow all to have a love in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, power for the people. Oh, wow. So now, so now we get down to business. So now we get down to business, brothers and sisters and comrades. First of all, about what some people call the trial. Now, what he's talking about the Huey P. Newton trial. I mean, excuse me, the uh, Bobby Seale trial. We call it a hedicomb. We call it a hedicomb. That's spelled H E C A T O M B. And I know there's enough dictionaries floating around up here to probably fill the room up so you can check that out. It means a sacrifice. It usually, it usually means a sacrifice of an animal. So we are like you. If you like to do that, so people ask you, quote, have you been to the trial? 
tell them that you have been down or heard about the hecticon because that's what it is. It's a public sacrifice. It's a situation where they're trying to unjustly, illegally try our chairman, who was Bobby Seale at the time. We look at it as a 1969 manifestation of the Dred Scott decision. We look at Chairman Bobby as being a manifestation of Dred Scott in 1857. And for the comrades that don't understand that decision, he's going to explain it a little bit. And we look at Judge Hoffman as being a manifestation of Judge Taney in 1857. Because in 1857, Dred Scott was a Negro, a former slave. He was still a slave because we're slaves who went into court and evidently had some type of misunderstanding about what he was in American society, where he fit in. So he went to the Supreme Court to have Judge Taney answer and try to clear up some mistaken ideas that he had floating around in his little old head. And Judge Taney did just that, brothers and sisters and comrades. Mm -hmm. Judge Taney explained to him very clearly that, quote, nigga, you're nobody, you're property, you're a slave, that the systems, the legal system, the judicial system, all type of systems that are functioning in America today were set up long before you got here, brother, because we brought you over to make money, to keep what we got going. These avaricious, greedy businessmen, to keep what they got going, going on. And Jared Scott couldn't understand this. There was a big rebuttal. And at that time, Judge Taney made a statement that has become famous. And that statement, maybe not in the same words, but through actions and through social practice is being manifested down at the new register building at Jackson and Gilborn. It's being manifested through Judge Hoffman by saying the same thing that Judge Taney said in 1857 when he told Dred Scott that, quote, nigga, a black man in America has no rights, which a white man is bound to respect, unquote. And that's the same thing that Judge Hoffman is telling our chairman every day. And let me say, brothers and sisters, there's a uh, Netflix documentary out on the Chicago 8. And for comrades who haven't watched it, it'll come through a lot clearer what Fred Hampton is saying if you watch that documentary, it's called the Chicago Eight. Uh, Jerry, uh, uh, Jerry, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Bobby Seale, Jerry Hoffman, I mean, not Hoffman, Abdeman, and a couple other uh, beatnik cats at the time. And we understand, you know, a lot of people have hangups with the party because the party talks about a class struggle. And the people that have those hangups are opportunists and cowards and individualists and everything that's anything but revolutionary. And they use these things as an excuse to justify and to alibi and to bona fide their lack of participation in the real revolutionary struggle. Come on, Fred Hampton, with the words. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, my boy, my boy spitting. <laughs> so they say, quote, I could dig the Panther Party because the Panthers they are engrossed with dealing with oppressive country radicals or white people or hunkies or what have you. They said these are some of the excuses that I use to negate really what I'm not, why I'm not in the class struggle. And let me say it was important at the time to, this, to define uh, the mother country radicals uh, 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 in that language to give the young people an understanding that though they came from the imperial core, they did not have to carry on the crimes of the Imperial Court. So the Black Panther Party came up with the term mother country radicals. That was primarily coined by Elvis Cleaver. And it's a good, it's a good, and it's still relevant to this day. We got a lot of answers for those people. First of all, we say primarily that the priority of this struggle is class, that Marx and Lenin and Che Guevara and Mousy Tone and anybody else that has said or knew or practiced anything about revolution always said that a revolution is a clash struggle, not a legislative process, <laughs> but a clash struggle. <laughs> it was one class that oppressed those 
excuse me, it was one class to oppress. There was other class to oppress them. And it's got to be a universal fact that those that don't admit to that or are those that don't want to get involved in a revolution because they know as long as they're dealing with the race thing, they'll never be involved in a revolution. They could talk about numbers. They can hang you up in many, many ways. But as soon as you start talking about class, then you got to start talking about some guns. And that's what the party had to do. When the party started to talk about class struggle, we found that we had to start talking about some guns. If we never negated the fact that there was racism in America, but we said that when you, the byproduct, what comes off as racism, that capitalism comes first and next is racism. And that is important. I'm gonna read that one more time. Essentially, he is saying that all of our ills primarily spring from the source of capitalism. They use racism as a tool, as an instrument to divide the people, to divide the oppressed class, to divide the oppressed uh, nationalities. And that's very important. Capitalism is the reason why they murdered uh, the indigenous people in the millions. Capitalism is the reason why we was transported from Africa over here to work the uh, agricultural fields. Capitalism is the reason why they are in Latin America. Capitalism is the reason why they drop a bombs right now in Africa under the uh, African command. Capitalism is the reason why Latin America still have copper doors, puppets of the imperial core. So we have to understand what is the principal enemy and that is capitalism, not race. That when they brought slaves over here, it was to take, it was to make money. So first the idea came that we want to make money. Then the slaves came in order to make that money. That means that capitalism had to, through historical fact, racism had to come from capitalism, brothers and sisters. It had to be capitalism first, and racism was a byproduct of that. Oh, wow. Anybody that doesn't admit that is shown through non admittance and their non participation in the struggle, that all they are are people who fail to make a commitment. And that's the bottom line. Anytime we get into conversations, brothers and sisters and comrades, with people in the streets, they're going to be those who say, well, my personal religion guides my uh, 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 materialist uh, viewpoint or idealist viewpoint. You're going to have workers to say, well, the union is for which I base my uh, analysis. You're going to have nonprofits. You're going to have people uh, from different strata of life. But the most important thing is to understand whenever we engage a conversation, it must come through the lens of a class analysis. Anything beyond that to be setting ourselves up for another thousand years talking about this stuff. Education, enough, I'm gonna read it again. Anybody that doesn't admit that is showing through non-admittance and their non-participation in the struggle that all they are are people who fail to make a commitment and that the only thing that they have going for them is the education that they receive at these institutions. Education enough to teach, to teach them some alibis and teach them that you have got to be black and you have got to change your name. And that's crazy. The Minister of Education of the party, Raymond Messiah Hewitt, and Chief of Staff David Hewitt just got back from Africa visiting Elders Cleveland. And they said, niggas over there never will be wearing the type of garb that some of these Africanized fools over here wear. They're, we they're wearing rags or either they're wearing nothing. But if you want to dress like some African people, then you ought to dress like the Angolans or the people in Mozambique. These cats right here have revolutions. That's why he's naming them, these countries. These are the people that are doing something. You need to dress like people that are in liberation struggles. But nah, you don't want to get that Africanized because as soon as you have to dress like somebody from Angola or Mozambique, then you put on whatever you put on. And it could be anything from rags to something like Saks Avenue. You got to also, excuse me, you got to put on some bandoliers and some AR-15s and some uh, 38s. You have got to put on some Smith & Wessons and some Colt 45s because that's 
what they're wearing in Mozambique and in Cuba and in uh, Latin America at the time. And any nigga that runs around here telling you that when your hair is long and you got a dashiki on and you got boobas and all these sandals and all this type of action, then you're a revolutionary. And anybody that doesn't look like you, he's not. That man has to be out of his mind because we know that political power, power doesn't flow from the sleeve of a dashiki or an African name or an African school. We know that political power flows from the barrel of a gun. And what this means is keep politics in command. That, that, the gun is only used to defend the humanity, integrity, and dignity of oppressed people. It's not used to extort the people. It's not used to threaten the people. In fact, you can't even lift the gun up in the revolutionary army unless you're targeting it against the enemy or you're in practice. So understand in the movement, we have a thing called keep politics in command. That's what that means. Whenever you use the gun, you are instituting or implementing a political program that, that, that benefits the people uh, at all times. Oh, wow. Be because we know that political power doesn't flow from the sleeve of a dashiki. We know that political power flows from the barrel of a gun. And that's true. It has to be true. We know that in order to be able to talk about power, All power. That, that what you have got to be able to talk about is the ability to control and define phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner. Catch that, brothers and sisters. This is real deep right here. That means that if you can't control and define phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner, then you don't even have any dealings with power. You don't know, and you probably never will know what power is. Let me back that up and say, how do you make uh, a, a phenomenon act in a desired manner? Look at what you're doing in your communities. There are people probably being kicked out of their houses. There are people probably being put up against the wall and knocked in the head by the police. There are people probably being uh, uh, racially discriminated against the some phase of American society. You go there, you organize those people. You tell those people your situation may be one of hopelessness with the kind of thinking you have now. But if we come together, educate ourselves, organize ourselves, we can take this racist and make it act in a desired manner by humbling him either with the punch or with the bullet. Either way, we can make him act in a desired manner because we have got the political education right now to know what we're fighting against and to know who our friends are and to know who our enemies are. So that's how you take a phenomenon and you work on it until it comes into the interest of the people. All power to the people. So that means that if you can't control and define phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner, then you don't even have any dealings with power. You don't know, and you probably never will know what power is. And we know that power, we, and we know what power is. And we know who's doing harm to the people, the enemy. And everybody wants to talk about the pork chops will tell you in a minute. The pigs don't want you to get, get black. They don't want you to get no black studies programs. They don't want you to wear dashikis. They don't want you to learn about the motherland and what roots to eat off the ground. They don't want that because as soon as you get that, as soon as you get back 11th century, see, I can't see this at the bottom. Take over, Charm. As soon as you see, as soon as you go back, let me say to culture. You see it? Yeah, I see it. You want me to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. I can't see the bottom. Let me see if I can fix All it on my screen. to the people. And anybody wants to talk about the pork chops, will tell you in a minute. Now, the pork chops, comrades, brothers and sisters, are the cultural nationalists. That was the cats on the United Slave, Ron Karenga, the puppet of Ronald Reagan, and the cat that took arms up and murdered uh, a bunch of Carter and John Huggins. He was referring to that whole crew that found that Kwanzaa. They yeah, called them pork. And she going, he going, he going to go back to it. He going to hit us with it. Oh, he going to go into it. Okay. Yeah, he going to go into it. Check the, check the people who went back to 11th century culture. Check the people that are wearing dashikis and boo-boos and think that that's going to freedom. Check all these people. Check, check all of these people. Find out where they're located. Find out the addresses of their office. 
write them a letter and ask them if in the last year, how many times their office been attacked and then write any Black Panther Party anywhere in the United States of America, anywhere in Babylon and ask them how many times the pigs have attacked them. Then when you get your estimate of the stuff that come back up on the screen, go ahead Zulu. Then when you, I'm looking for it, I don't see it. Go ahead, Zulu. Then when you get your um estimate, go ahead, Zulu, read it. When you get your um, I I go to the whole thing. I go to the whole thing. So we won't um, keep. But I want you to do the whole thing. I'm, I'm gonna fix my screen, Chairman. All right, fix your, all right, fix your chair uh, screen. All power to the people. All right, so and then write any Black Panther Party anywhere in the United States of America, anywhere in Babylon, and ask them how many times the pigs have attacked them. Then when you get your estimation of both of them, then you figure out what the pigs don't like. Catch that. That's deep right there. Because Mousy Tongue said, brothers and sisters, in the red book, if the enemy, well, not in the red book, but in his uh, uh, his writings, he said that if the enemy paints you in the blackest negative of light, we should consider that a badge of honor because we're doing something right. And this is what this is what the chairman just said right here. Oh, we have been we have been attacked three times since June. We know what pigs don't like. And we have got people run out of the country by the hundreds. We know what pigs don't like. Our minister of defense is in jail. Our chairman is in jail. Our minister of information is in exile. Our treasurer, the first member of the party is dead, who was Bobby uh, Hutton, brothers and sisters, little Bobby Hutton at 17 years old. The deputy minister of defense and the deputy minister of information, Bunchy, our Prince Bunchy Carter and John Huggins from Southern California murdered by some court chops talking about a black student union program. We know what the pigs don't like. We say nobody was shooting Panther but a pig because Panthers don't pose a threat to anybody but pigs. And if people tell you that Panthers pose, pose threats, then ask them what kind of sense what kind of sense it will make unless it's to get up at five o'clock in the morning to feed somebody's son and then at three o'clock that afternoon shoot him save a meal we don't need we don't need to do that what sense does it make for us to open up a free health clinic where the only prerequisite that you got to have to receive free medical aid is the prerequisite that just that you be sick and and we've got students who jobbing themselves and running around playing, talking about they doing something for the struggle. And I want to know what more could you do? And do all people come from Chicago? People talk about the party co-opted by white folks. That's what that mini fascist Stokely Carmichael said. Ooh, you want to talk about that, this um chairman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me talk, let me talk on that. So comrades don't leave here with a misunderstanding. Let me say that. Uh, the Black Panther Party brought SNCC into the organization in 1968. That was H. Rap Brown, that was Stokely Carmichael, and James Foreman. And they gave them positions of leadership, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Justice, and Minister of, I forget what John Foreman got. But in any event, uh, Stokely Carmichael was a nationalist. He's always been a nationalist. And he had disagreements with Aldrich Cleaver and when they left the party, he started talking about those disagreements out in the open. And Cointel Pro, J. Edgar Hoover, sent letters uh, to uh, the Black Panther Party leadership saying that Stokely Carmichael was Stokely Flames uh, to cause a uh, bitter war amongst Black Panthers. And so we should watch him. And they put a lot of like, uh, 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 Stokely Carmichael. Then after then, he was attacked by the Black Panthers, Elchis Cleaver and others, fell right into a Corey Tell Pro's uh, uh, tactics. And so he had to leave the country. And when he left the country, we all know he ended up in Guinea Con Conakry. But he is no, let me be clear and say that Kwame Torre is no frankly of white power. Uh, he, had, he has no many fascists. We may have differences with the African Revolutionary People's Party, which is the group that he started, and it's still functioning in the country. Uh, a lot of sisters are a part of that, and I have a, a, a modicum of respect for them. Uh, but he is no fascist. I just wanted to put that out there. 
all power, Trevor, all power. Go ahead. You want to finish reading that? He's nothing but a go ahead. You want you, you got it? All power. He's nothing but a, a jack of nap. A jack of nap, I gotta explain that term too, where a term they use for criminal elements in the organization. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's a jack of nap because I have been knowing him for years, and that's all he could be. If he go around murder mouthing the Black Panther Party. If we're co-opted by white people, then check the locations of our offices. Our breakfast program, our free health clinic is opening probably this Sunday at 16th and Springfield. No does everybody know, now does everybody know where 16th and Springfield is at. That's not in Winnetaka, you understand? That's not in the Cobb, that's in Babylon. That's in the heart of Babylon, brothers and sisters. And that free health clinic was put there because we know where the problem is. We know that black people are most oppressed. And if we didn't know that, then why the hell would we be running around talking about the black liberation struggle has to be the vanguard for all liberation struggles? Oh, wow. If there's ever going to be any liberation in the mother country, ever going to be any liberation in the colony, then we got to be liberated by the leadership of the Black Panther Party and the Black liberation struggle. We don't, we don't negate that. We're not hung up with anybody. We not, we're not hung up with anybody's not a panther. We don't want to get you thinking that because we can dig Fred. I mean, Everett. <laughs> we could dig him. Everett uh, is the last name of Ron Coringa. Oh, wow. But we can't dig Ron Coringa and Leroy Jones, who is a maid Baraka. Uh, incidentally, brothers and sisters, his son is the president uh, where we at in North New Jersey right now, Ross Baraka. We can't dig that. We 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 can but see. Hey, hold up, hey, hey, hold up, Chevy, the mayor, the mayor. The mayor, yes. That's uh, Leroy Jones is a maid Baraka. That's his father right there. <laughs> oh, power to the people. Oh, power. Uh, 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 but we can't dig Ron Coringa and Leroy Jones. We can't dig that. And the reason is this, bro. Let me say this, be honest. Over here in 1968, or, yeah, 68, right after uh, the maid Baraka got out of prison, uh, they held a press conference where Imperiali, he was the chief of the pigs here in North, and the brothers and sisters of the Black Panther Party office just got bombed on Springfield Avenue. And so the Panthers and the BLA and other uh, allies, the uh, SDS, the Weathermen, they were upset and they wanted some action. And May Baraka held a press conference with the chief of the pigs and denounced the Black Panther Party. And, 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 and that's why he is mentioned by Fred Hampton as being a flunky. So I want brothers and sisters who are reading May Baraka today. He got a thousand books out, a wonderful poem. But back then, he was a hardcore cultural nationalist. He started a lot of that cultural nationalist stuff here in the city of North Black Congress, Black House, Kawaita, which is the philosophy of Ron Kalinga and the US organization. So I just wanted to put that out there and be clear. We, but we can't dig Ron, oh, excuse me. We know that they both have long names, <laughs> longer than my arm. And both of them supposed to be so intelligent and so smart. And that's the problem right now. We're talking about destroying the system. And they have hangups doing that because they're constantly buying property within the system. Catch that, brothers and sisters. Catch that. We're talking about destroying the system. And they have hangups doing that because they're constantly buying property within the system. And it's kind of hard to them to burn up on Tuesday what they brought last Monday. <laughs> yeah, but oh, hey, hey, Chairman, you hear me, Chairman? All oh, power to the people. Hey, hey, like, no, because I, I really need the people that's listening right now to understand what we're talking about here. You know, this is 1969, 68, whatever. And they're talking about it um, in Mary Baraka. They call him, his name used to be Leroy Jones before he changed his name to Mary Baraka. And he was attacking the Panthers back then. And the Panthers were telling you in 68, 69, you can't trust this guy right here because he wants to assimilate. He wants to buy up the property that we turn talking about we need to burn down in the community. So you can't trust these people. 
And fast forward to 2023. His son is the mayor of the city, the same city that the black people, the poor people were fighting against the state, the state sanctioned murderers against. And he was speaking up for his son. Yeah, his son is now the mayor, which have his son under his leadership. 60% of the homes in the city belong to corporations. In other words, we have no community. These corporations own our homes. They know you don't own anything. And the gentrification that's going on is being done under his son. Like there's a legacy to this. And those people that he was talking about, they were called cultural nationalists, which mean they all cloak themselves with, the, with, with, with identity politics, with our culture, while pushing assimilation and the, um, and the ideals of our oppressors. Yo, that is deep. Yo, that, that, yo, this speech right here, like it speaks. He's speaking to us from like 50 years ago and warning us and telling us, and now we are living it. We are living. Yo, we got poison water. We can't drink our water. The, man, the managers of our oppression are his children now, or uh, Emiri Baraka's children. Those are the managers of our oppression in the city now. And this is this is not inflammatory. I'm not making no dispersion. Yo, there, there's reports, there's stories. Everything is out there. Like, so if you go somewhere, if you go look it up, you're not gonna look in there and it's gonna say that I lied, that 60% of our homes belong to corporations, that the community is being gentrified. All these things is going on, that the water is poison. All this stuff is going on now. And the managers of this are the children of Amiri Baraka. That's deep, that's deep. We don't, yo, this, you don't even need to go on with the rest of this speech because his point is proven. It's a class struggle, God damn it. Carry on, Chairman. All power to the people. We're talking about destroying the system and they have hangups doing that because they're constantly buying property within the system. And it's kind of hard to burn up on Tuesday what you brought last Monday. And the mayor's a millionaire. I just want to say that. I almost forgot. Actually, he uh, just accumulated $5 million. He came in office 2016, and I just read his uh, balance account. He got $5 million in his personal account. He came mm -hmm. in with probably 30, 40. Well, he was a teacher at that time, but he didn't have no millions. But in any event, that's what they do. And if you mm -hmm. just look at what's the last part right here, uh, Captain, you look uh -huh. at what's happening in Jackson, Mississippi. Chuck Wayne Lamuba. Uh, a lot of congressmen may not be familiar with him, but his father and his son is in office over there. Chuck Lane Mumba comes out of the movement, Republican New Africa. He defended with Tulu Shakur and Tupac and all those cats uh, when they was on trial. And he was the principal ideological leader of the New African People's Organization. And they said the Republican New Africa's headquarters was going to be in Jackson, Mississippi. So all, uh, now look who's in office. Uh, Chuck Lane Lumumba Jr. You know, so these cats with these kind of ideas shows us in practice that they're not anti-capitalist. Actually, they just want a piece of the pie for themselves. But let me finish up the study. Because they're a bunch of unrepentant capitalists. They'll never repent and they know better. We try to make excuses for them. Maybe they'll have to go through stages, Fred. No, that's not it. Because they're much older than we are. I'm 21. 20, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna emphasize this. I'm 21 years old. Oh wow. We're all young. So stages they done went through them already. Ron Karinka has more degrees than a thermometer. That's right. He has more degrees than a thermometer, and he continues to do what he's doing. And how do they fool you? Because they pick the leaders they want, and mm. they put those people up there and portray them as being your leaders when in fact they're leaders of nobody mm. we we call the oppressed apologists because after something's happened all they could do is apologize al Sharpton, uh uh crump uh, all these cats all they do is apologize although they try to hold the enemy and the court to the strictness of their law but look what their programs consist of going when they're giving a speech and big and black and uh, indigenous and other oppressed people to just hold on for one more day that Congress gonna get it right with this George Floyd bill. 
and that's what they do. So we have to. <laughs> no, nah, seriously. Right. Chairman, they I like to chime in. Um, he's describing the gentleman that was in the movie, the Panther movie. The fake, like, Afrocentric, give me my libation woman. That, that was Karenga. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was Karenga. He was actually supposed to be protecting um, Malcolm X's wife with empty guns. Like, those people, they crazy. Yeah. They're yeah. Yeah, for the people that people, like the movie that we were supposed to watch last week, in the movie, there was a portrayal of Karenga and the Black nationalist groups in the movie. And that's what, um, the, the secretary was saying just now, like they were in the movie. Those are people, um, the Leroy Jones. Those, yeah, those are the people that they were talking about. But um, carry on, um, Chairman. All right, power to the people. Look, look in the papers. Now they're drawing pictures of the chairman, Chang and Gag. Don't you know that if the news media, the established press, had moved before this, that they could have stopped this rising tide of fascism years ago. But they're endorsed. They're joined. But they endorsed. They joined. They supported what fascists were doing. Were doing all the time. And let me say, brothers and sisters, that haven't studied the Cointel Pro documents, there is a section on journalism. The New York Times, Washington Post, uh, 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 and other established papers would get letters from J. Edgar Hoover saying that the Black Panther Party was poisoning kids, or saying that. Uh, uh, Martin Luther King was a bad man and he should commit suicide and all that kind of stuff. And they would publish that stuff. These was willing German flunkies uh, of the establishment. So this is what Fred is talking about. Now we know because we got the documents to show that journalism actually, uh, the journalists in America actually lied on the Black liberation struggle and the anti-imperialist struggle. Had moved before. They endorsed, they supported what fascists was doing all the time. And now it's getting, now it's being heaped down upon all of the people. A lot of people think that now that their hands are getting dirty, we call them ideological servants of United States fascism. And that's what they are. That's what they are. That's who our shopping is, brothers and sisters. You know, that's who uh, uh, some of our family members are. We might not want to admit it, but some of us are ideological servants of fascism. And that's what they are because they serve fascism by doing nothing about it until the law goes over and then they apologize for it. They get ap apologetic. We say it's the same press, the same enemy press that we look at and believe and think is bona fide. The same enemy press that talked us into believing that we were somebody when in fact we were nobody. I think there's any, I think there's anything more important. I think what Malcolm X says is important. Now think back. Those students were laughing at Malcolm X. Can you dig it? They were laughing at Malcolm X. Wow. Regis Debray. Let me stop here. All right, brothers and sisters. Regis Debray was a French revolutionary that migrated to Bolivia and fought along with Che Guevara. And he wrote a book that was very important at the time called Revolution Within Revolution. And he talked about the focal theory that Fidel Castro and Che were spreading at the time. So he's talking about Regis Debray right here. So catch this out. Wow, Regis Debray, he says the revolutionaries are in the future, that militants and pork chops and all these people, radical students are in the present and that most of the rest of the people try to remain in the past. That's when somebody comes, that's in the future, a lot of us can't understand him. The same thing that you couldn't understand Huey P. Newton now, you, you don't understand Malcolm when he was living. But we know that when Malcolm left, the well almost ran dry. You don't miss the water till the well runs dry. And it's almost ran dry. Huey P. Newton got to reading. And he's not like a lot of us. A lot of us read and read and read, but we get, but we don't get any practice. Brothers and sisters, comrades, we have a lot of knowledge in our heads, but we have never practiced it and made any mistakes and corrected those mistakes so that we would be able to do something properly. So we come up with 
like we say more degrees than a thermometer, but we're not able to walk across the street and chew bubble gum at the same time because we have all of that knowledge, but it's never been exercised. It's never been practiced. We never tested it with what's really happening. We call it testing it with objective reality. You might have any kind of door in your mind, but you, you have got to test it with what's out there. Do you see what I mean? They talk us into buying candy bars and throwing the candy bar away and eating a wrapper. They're the only people in the world, you understand? That's right. They can sell ice boxes to Eskimos. Mm -hmm. They can sell natural wigs to niggas that's got natural hair already. <laughs> and see, this is a shame. They could sell on one-legged man probably 24 tickets in an ass-licking context. And he knows he has no business being there. <laughs> see, these are the same thing. See, these are the things they can do to us. And then they have us believe that what they're telling us is right. It's bona fide. It's justified. We say that's wrong. That's incorrect. That Malcolm, when he spoke to students, and you probably heard that record, he speaks to some Jews, some slick people, and he told them, you might say, well, the way I feel, people ought to be able to walk around naked because rape is love. That's idealism. See what I mean? You're dealing in metaphysics. You're dealing in subjectivity because you're not testing it with objective reality. And what's really wrong is that you don't go test it because if you test it, you'll get objective. Because as soon as you walk out there, a whole lot of objective reality will vamp down upon your ass and rape you or whatever you have. And let me apologize for the words that, this words that he's using, rape, I uh, understand. In this day and time, you know, it's not appropriate to use that in the revolutionary movement. But comrades get the definite, get the way he's using it. He's talking in terms of raping you, raping the proletariat of his power. So whenever this happens, this ha this is when people get a whole lot of mistaken ideas. That's why a lot of you can't understand and can't agree with what a lot of what we said. You never tried it. You don't know whether people relate to the breakfast program because you never fed nobody. You don't know anything about the free health clinic because you never asked anybody. You don't know anything about the, the good that a gun does because you never tried one. We say that if you was born and if you said you didn't like pills and you never tasted pills, you would have to be a liar. You don't know whether you like pills, but you can't claim that you don't like pills. The only way that anybody can tell you the taste of a pill is if, is if he himself has tasted it. That's the only way. That's the objective reality. That's what the Black Panther Party deals with. We're not metaphysicians. We're not idealists. We're dialectical materialists. And we deal with what reality is, whether we like it or not. Oh, power. Oh, power. A lot of people can't relate to that because everything they do is guided by the way they like things to be. We say that's incorrect. You look and see how things are, and then you deal with that. We running around talking about, quote, we're going to love all Black people. We have an undying love for all Black people. And you know what? That if Malcolm came back, he would walk past a million Klansmen to get to Stokely Carmichael and whoop his motherfucking ass. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Yo. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> because Malcolm was standing right like this in the room where white people weren't even allowed. You hear me? They wouldn't allow no white people in there. But Malcolm dead now. Wow. Now what happened? What's this fool name? James Whitmore. Didn't he do his little skin test? Because they had names like 37X. Uh, this is the Nation of Islam. This is the Nation of Islam, brothers and sisters, who don't understand the 37X and the 15X. That was their last names because they had names like 37X, 15X, Black and then Black. And they were able to sneak in because of this ignorant 
patient that these maniacs are trying to whoop on us. We're gonna love all black people because every Negro is a potential black man. That man testified against Chairman Bobby in the conspiracy trial down in Chicago was a black man. Wow. The man that has Chairman Bobby on a murder trial in Connecticut is a black man. The man who murdered Malcolm X is a black man. Incidentally, I could go through all that, but for purposes of time, I will, we'll speed it up. The judge that denied Eldridge Cleaver bond after a white man had granted him bond, a nigga who investigated his own and said, nigga, I don't think you ought to be on the streets, was a black man. They're a good marshal. They're a good, no good marshal. That NAACP put it. <laughs> that's, hey, yo, that's one of the crazy. things. Yo, this is, hey, hey, Chairman, this is great. This is, these are all the people that they told us to idolize when we were children. All power to the people, all power to the people. And that's right, Sister Panther Queen from California, the, the man who murdered Nipsey and Tupac were black men, all power to the people for that uh, 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 answer. That's one of the things about sitting in and dying in and waiting game and crying in got us. If Daryl Gould Marshall had not been there, then Elvis Cleaver would probably still be with the people. He's a nigga, a bootlicker, a tonto, a jack o -nap. You understand? Gone. Don't think you should be on the streets. And we running around letting niggas tell us we got to love all black people. Mm -hmm. You heard about the conspiracy trial on the West Side that they were able to win with Doug Andrews and Fat Crawford <laughs> when they had the big bump on the West Side and the Martin Luther King riot. This is 67, brothers, when Martin Luther King moved, I mean, excuse me, 66, when Martin Luther King moved to Chicago. He was there for a whole year. He was trying to get some desegregation in Peoria, Illinois, and places like that. And the white folks were just like hit him, hit him in the face with bricks, spit, rocks, and sticks. So this is where he's told about the Uncle Toms that went against Martin Luther King during that period in 66. Ask him, brothers, what's wrong with you, brothers and sisters? Ask him, was that a white man? No, because Doug and them, they criticize us for being for our liberal stand. They call it liberal, so they don't let nobody in the hood but black people. <laughs> 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 but they but they didn't know anybody ever hear about gloves on the south side of Chicago. Now this is the this is the man that murdered Fred Hampton later on. Catch that, brothers and sisters. Glover's Davis. I'm gonna read that one more time. But they didn't know anybody ever heard about Glover's Davis on the south side of Chicago. He's not white. Glover's Davis was later on one of the Chicago policemen that participated in Fred's assassination. Did you think that Buckley was white? Buckley, who's talking all of your brothers and all of your little sisters and all of your little cousins and nephews, and he's going to continue to take them. And if you don't do anything, he's going to take your sons and your daughters. And a lot of niggas is going to school now and trying to make a name. We don't hear nobody running around talking about um, Benedict Arnold III because Benedict Arnold's children don't want to talk about them. They're his children. You hear about people talking about they might be Patrick Henry children, people that stood up and said, give me liberty or give me death, or Paul Revere's cousin. Paul Revere said, get your guns. The British are coming. The British were the police at the time. Huey said, get your guns, brothers and sisters. The pigs are coming. Same thing. There'll be a lot of Huey Newtons running around. A lot of your kids will be calling themselves Huey P. Newton III, all oh, power to the people. Oh, wow. They won't be calling, they won't be calling themselves Uga Booga or Karinga Tanga, Karinga, or Mama Longa Karinga. None of that shit. <laughs> they, they won't be calling themselves that, you see. Ask the pigs in California. Ask them, you see that. Hand me one of them posters, brother. The one right there. Now, if you think I'm lying, look at this. Take a look at this. Now, all you sisters here, tell me what looks better. A nigga running around in a robe and a staff pole looking like Moses or these bad, these are the baddest looking, you might think, you might say, you're chauvinistic, organizational chauvinistic, you might call it. 
You might call me wrapped up in the party's own ego, but I'm wrapped up in the truth. And I think the sister can verify that these are the baddest. These are the movie stars for Babylon, goddammit. Huh? Fuck John Wayne and all this other shit. <laughs> all right. But you see, if you look at that, that's what we look good in. We don't carry, we don't care if niggas wear dashikis. You understand? That's not going to mean anything in the final analysis. But we're saying that you need some tools. You ever had the occasion to have a doctor come to your house or a plumber come to your house? Suppose a plumber come to your house. He opened up his bag and he had stethoscopes and thermometers and the hydro, hydro needles and syringes. You would say, you came to fix the plumbing? Brother, you got the wrong tools. Something <laughs> suspicious is going on because you don't even have the proper tools. Ain't that right? Suppose somebody came to deliver your baby and he had plumber's tools. I know you sisters would scream bloody murder, bloody murder. No, but you say, this is not right, brother. We can't have this. You got to, you understand, you got to come a little easier. You got to show me something better. You got to have some tools that are more appropriate for the occasion. You understand? Because I don't have any running forces or anything. <laughs> so when people come into our community with tank with tanks, when they come into Babylon or Warsaw, Warsaw is a, a city in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Poland, a city in Poland, I apologize, or whatever you want to call it, like they did into Henry Horner's projects, and that's a manifestation of a very clear manifestation of what's happening in Babylon. When they do that, when they come and there with tanks, and those tanks are tools. Those tanks are tools of war. Catch that, brothers and sisters. They're declaring war in the community. And if you, when they come into the community with tanks, you come out with dashikis and nothing but dashikis and boobas and nothing but boobas, sandals and nothing but sandals, then you're in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. Mm. You better go back in the house. If you have to strip button naked, if you got to get asshole naked, put you on even if nothing but a holster and a gun and some ammunition. Take your bare ass, you understand? And don't consider you being naked. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will try, you understand, to whistle at you or anything like that. Cause this will be this will be gone from the minute. Any kind of sexual attraction you had will be gone. Cause then we'll be looking at Mr. and Mrs. Co 45, Mr. and Mrs. 357 Magnum. <laughs> and the shapes on them are the best shapes we have in Babylon to deal with. And you brothers holding a 357 Magnum in your hand, there ain't nothing that feels like a 357 Magnum except one of those beautiful black sisters. But we need 357 Magnums also. <laughs> well, Fred had a way with words. <laughs> when, we, when we go out there, we'll be able to protect ourselves. Huey P. Newton issued a mandate a long time ago. And I brought, I advised brothers and sisters to read that mandate. It said to die for the people. It was the secretary mandate number three. It states, it said, we need to draw the line of demarcation. And when pigs move on our craves, we have to protect our craves with gun force. Pigs don't move on panthers' craves. When they move on panthers' craves, they make sure the panthers are out of town. We had a situation where they moved on a panther crib and they had three helicopters above his crib. I'm serious, I'm serious. See, they come prepared, brothers and sisters, because they know when they come into a panther crib that we might talk a lot of rhetoric, but we deal with the same basic jargon that the people in Babylon deal with. It takes two to tangle, baby. It takes two to tangle, motherfucker. As soon as you kick that door down, it have to kick it. It it it, 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 it have to kick it back to you. We don't lock our doors. We just get us some good guns and leave the motherfuckers open. And when the people come in there, we put something on them that will make them go to the hardware, buy a lot, come back. 
put the door closed, lock it, and stay, stay their ass outside. <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna move as quickly as we possibly can for the people with the questions and answers and the people with the guilt syndrome and the people that have been embarrassed and shamed and disgraced. And we've talked about their leaders like Leroy Jones and Malama, Malama Karanga, Karanga, a big bald headed Bazumi as far as we're concerned. That's what he is. We think that if he's gonna continue to wear dashikis that he ought to stop wearing pants, because he look a lot better in the miniskirt. That's all the motherfucking man needs in Babylon that ain't got no gun, and that's a, minis a miniskirt. And maybe he can trick his way out of something, because he's not going to shoot his way out of nothing. He won't fight temptation, but he never killed anybody but the Black Panther member. Name somebody. Name me a time you read about Karangatang's office being attacked. The only time he ever had the occasion to use a gun was on the apprentice Bunchy Carter, a revolutionary. This brother had more revolutionary poetry for a motherfucker than anybody. Revolutionary culture. John, John Huggins, the only time they lifted a gun was against these people. As Huey says in prison, when they lifted their hands against Bunchy and when they lifted their hands against John, they lifted their hands against the best that Babylon possesses. And you should say that. You should feel, you should feel any time when the Revolutionary Brothers die. You never heard about the party going on around murdering people. You dig, you dig what I'm saying? Think about it. I'm not even gonna tell you. You think about it for yourself. Fish, you was trying to say something? We started the Black Panther Party in 1966. I'm gonna tell you the whole story in a minute. We started dealing with pigs. You think we scared of a few karangatangs, a few chumps, a few male chauvinists? They tell their women walk behind me. Quote, the only reason a woman should walk behind a fat, <laughs> hey yo, we in 2023. This word, this, this language may be may not be appropriate of a fast talking legal guy. <laughs> Beyond a faggot like, like that is so she can put his foot knee deep in his ass. We don't need no culture except revolutionary culture. What we mean by that is a culture that will free you. You heard your field lieutenant talking about fire in the room, didn't you? What you worry about when you got a fire in this room? You worry about water or escape. You don't worry about nothing else. If you say, um, quotation, what's your culture during this fire? Water, that's my culture. Brother, that's my culture. Because culture's a thing that keeps you, that keeps you. What's your politics? Escape and water. What's your education? Escape and water. When people ask us about our culture, we say our cultures, guns, guns, I'm saying, let me bring that back. When people ask us about our culture, we say our culture's guns, baby. Our culture's revolutionary art, like that. And when you see those two brothers who picked up them guns and went out into Babylon in 66, when a lot of us were scared to do anything except lock ourselves up in closets and listen to Coltrane, ain't that something for, who for whooping their motherfuckers' ass? And this turned us, this turned us on and this made us black enough that we were bad. Then this made us black enough to get out and launch a blanket indictment at the murder mountain rest of the black people. Nigga, you ain't got no natural nigga. How come you you how come your name ain't changed? As the pigs in California ask him, who do you fear most? Ron Malema Karanga or Huey P. Newton? Who is named after a demon? What is that? A, a, a de, de, demagogic, 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 demagogic line politician, Huey P, Huey P. Long. And pigs don't care about that because you don't have to call. If your shotguns a browning, you don't have to give it no African name. 
Because believe me, it shoots the same. You understand? It shoots the same. Changing your name is not going to change our set of arrangements. The only thing that's going that's going to change our set of arrangement is what's what's guiding us into this set of arrangements, and that's the oppressor. And it's on three three stages. We call it we call it the three in one: avaricious, greedy businessmen, demagogic, demag what do you come on man, demagog demagogic. Is it demagogic or dem demagogic? Lying demagogic. Yeah, demagogic, lying politicians. And racist pig, fascist, reactionary cops. Until you deal with those three things, then your set of arrangements will remain the same. The only difference will be that you're still under fascism. But instead of Fred being under fascism, I'll be ooga booga under fascism. But I'll feel the same. I, um, hey, Chairman, what he's trying to say there is, um, like they'd rather be black cultural nationalists under fascism. Yeah, look at Haiti as a good example where Papa oh. Dr. Duval, you wear, uh, uh, Haiti, everything white. He even had a red, black, and green flag, but he murdered millions and millions of black people and was a puppet of the United States. So he's saying you can have a African name and you can have a Uga Booga name, whatever, but you still uh, are implementing the fascist arrangement. arrangement. Like like Leroy Jones, like Amiri Baraka, like Ross Baraka. You may oh, have okay, these African people. names, but you're still working under white supremacy and oppressing your people. Right or wrong? All power to the people. Instead of me going to the to the gas chamber, I'll go to an African section of the gas chamber. <laughs> we so <still laughs> Africanized, <laughs> we so Africanized over here that if Africans came over here, you'd have to give them a catalog to find out. What the fuck they, they they were buying? That's right. You'd have to give them a catalog to find out what the fuck they were buying. You got posters and pictures and names. We're naming things and naming ourselves names they never even heard of. And we call ourselves Africanized. Ain't that something? If you're racist, let me tell you something. Or if you're a reactionary nationalist, white folks run it. Go to South Africa and ask them. Go ahead. If you want an example of cultural nationalism, the best one I can give you is Papa Doc Duvalue in Haiti. All the black people, we need some black, some blackness, Papa Doc. Navolia said, right on. We need some blackness. Let's get all the white folks out of here. Got all the white folks out, and now he's oppressing all the black folks. Black managerial class. Everywhere you look in our in our community, in our society, if you live if you live in a black urban city in a black area, everything is black, black or brown. Everything is controlled by our people, but we're still catching hell. And they're telling you here in 1968, 67, 66, 65, they're telling you that that path would not save us, would not liberate us. Putting these people in office, black or brown, just because they look like us, that don't mean anything is going to change. And like, and we see it. We have, yo, we have the luxury. You see, in science, you have to wait. You have to gather the um the data, the information, and wait and see all this stuff to see if it's gonna come true. Yo, we lucky. It's like we in a we, we in a time portal. Like we reading this. Just imagine if you're reading this in sixty six or sixty seven or sixty eight, and you're reading it and you hear them saying these things, and then fast forward to twenty twenty three, and you look outside, you look everywhere. All these people are in power. The children of these people are in power and our communities are worse off. When the black folks complain about it, he says, well, goddamn, what you all complaining about now? I'm black. I can't do nothing wrong, brother. We already qualified that. That's why these apologists like Wesley South come on the air and to wrap that sophistry that the system sophistry. was talking Sophistry that the system was talking about. Talking about their Ballyhooing, really, just rapping about nothing because they're jack jackanaps in our community allowed to remain there only because of their skin complexion, and we ought to drive them out. Yo, think about it. Think like think about what they just said. Like take a second and just think about what they just said in just in this slide right here. Like this is what we're dealing with currently right now. The Obamas, 
the um, Jeffries in Congress, all these black and brown politicians that make all these promises that we know are never going to come true. You've got Bobby Seale chained and gagged at the federal building. You've got James and Michael Soto, who was murdered in two days. By the way, for all you white folks who claim you're radicals, that claim you're going to support the party, we move and we're saying that there's no better, there's no higher Marxist than Huey P. Newton, not Chairman Mao Zedong or anybody else. We are saying that unless people show us through their social practice that they relate to the struggle in Babylon, that means that they're not inter internationalists. That means that they're not revolutionaries, truly Marxist, Leninist revolutionaries. We, I want to talk about that later, about, about the, um, the Marxist yeah. and the proletarian and all of that, because I, I, I don't like how they felt about lumping proletarian. And I really feel more akin to the lumping proletarians than the proletarians, if the proletarians are like people like teachers. But anyway. Yeah, yeah no, but uh, there's a, um, a wonderful booklet out there that you should study. Uh, and I should put it out to the comrades called Lumping Ideology of the Black Panther Party put out by Eldridge Cleaver. And catch, and when, uh, the reason why it's important that uh, you made that distinction is because that's where you come from. That's the uh, of the quagmire of uh, oppression that you come from. And so we understand the lumping element was uh, throughout history called the scum uh, of the working class because they were the class. But over time, they took on the power with the advent of technology and the industrialization of America and the world. And they began to use that technology as a tool to divide and oppress the working people, the black community, the brown community, and the poor white communities. So now that gave us an added advantage where the lumpings are in the prison system. You got some 9.5 million people connected to the enemy criminal justice system. You got some 6 million that are some form of probation, parole, or something connected to the criminal justice system. You got 2.3 million people in prison a day. So what are we going to do about that? So that's a whole class of people, left and proletariat elements that we have to bring into the movement and hope over time, our education and practice, they commit uh, class suicide and become a proletariat. But that comes through education. Like I'm a proletariat, even though uh, I'm not a classic Eurocentric proletarian, because I don't believe in that. You know, I'm a proletariat because I abandon lumper proletarian activities. And that's the distinction. A lumper proletarian is someone that lived on the margins of the economy. Like they sell drugs, they rob steel, or they live paycheck to paycheck, or they own food stamps or something like that. Over time, we have to become proletarians and abandon that lifestyle and become disciplined uh, in terms of workers. So I understand that uh, concept, and we have to work with the left of proletarians in a way that they join the revolution. If not, they're going to serve as a break on the revolution and work for the enemy. All power, all power. We look at Kim. We, we look at Kim Sun. We look at Comrade the Marshal, Marshal Kim, Marshal Kim Sun of Korea, is towering far and high above in his social practice as Mao Zedong. If you can relate to that, cool. If you can't relate to that, walk out with your ass picked clean like the chickens do. You dig? If you can't relate to that, and we're telling you that, and you motherfuckers who, who think you're so radical that you're trying to radicalize everything in Washington, and I don't know what the fuck you could radicalize because you ain't going to do nothing but walk between the bodies of two dead men, Lincoln and Washington, and I know you're going to stand up and gain no redress. But basically, this is working inside the system. When you say you're going to go through the electoral process, like what the fuck are you going in? How are you going in to to um, radicalize people that work for corporations, that work for oligarchs, that work for the oppressor? Like that shit make no sense. The only thing you're going to be doing is walking between Lincoln and Washington or whatever you said. All power. All power. There's just as much chance of Nixon giving you some redress if you can't get. 200,000 people to march on Washington. Wait, wait, if, yeah. if you can't get 200,000 people to march on Washington for something that's in Vietnam, why the fuck can't you get 200,000 people 
to come to Jackson and Dearborn, the federal building, and march for chairman of Babylon, the man who did more for Babylon and more for Vietnam than you marching maniacs will ever do, because you're not doing nothing for nobody but but floor but floor shims. What what floor shims? That's a shoe. That was a popular shoe at the time. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, You're making but, money walking. Yeah, but Floor Shams and Stetsons or Stacey Adams and anybody else because you're going to wear your souls out, your metaphysical souls and the souls on your shoes. And we say, if you can't relate to that, then fuck you. I like, I like, I like that. I like how you talk. You, you, sound, you remind me of somebody. Because of our lives. He, remind, he reminds us of you. <laughs> <laughs> Because our lives been consistent. We know the Marxist Leninists, people who might not want to dig on it. They say Marxist Leninists, they don't they don't curse. This is something we got from slave masters. We know niggas invented the word motherfucker. We wasn't fucking nobody mother. It was the master fucking people's mothers. We invented the word. You dig? We relate to that. We Marxist Leninist niggas, and we some Marxist Leninist cussing niggas, and we gonna continue to cuss. God damn it. Because <laughs> that's what we relate to. That's what's happening in Bab Babylon. That's objective reality. Don't nobody be walking around in Babylon spotting out at the mouth about a whole lot of academic bullshit, intellectually masturbating, catching diarrhea off the mouth. We say to those motherfuckers, if you want to catch a mouth disease, you come and talk that shit in the community where the Panthers are at. And you get a mouth disease, all right. You're going to get hoof, hoof in mouth, Panther hoof in mouth. That's a foot. So if you radicals can't relate to that, then fuck you. Because, because we know what Chairman Bobby did for the struggle. All power to the people. And we know that people in Vietnam, they know that peace. Just like Huey P. Newton tells about our motto that we are the advocates of the abolition of war. We do not want war, but we understand that war can only be abolished through war. That in order to put down the gun, make a man get rid of the gun, it's necessary to pick up a gun. And you motherfuckers that, that's for peace in Vietnam, the Black Panther Party is for victory in Vietnam. We say that they're aggressors, they're a bunch of, bunch of lackey running dogs that they're imperialists. They're a bunch of Wall Street warmongers and they need to be driven out of there. And the only way that the liberation of people oppressed people, Vietnam or the oppressed people of Babylon's freedom can be founded. It has to be founded on the land that is fertilized by the bones and the blood of these aggressive pig dogs that come into our communities and occupy our communities like troops occupy a foreign territory and go into Vietnam and fight and struggle relentlessly against the people in Vietnam that have right to self-determination. We don't care whether anybody likes it or not. That's our line. It's a Marxist-Leninist line. It's consistent. It's going to remain that way and it's been that way. If you can't get 200,000 people to come see about Bobby, then we say you're counter-revolutionary. That what you're doing is you're taking some kind of route from DeKalb where you're going to get to Vietnam without even passing the Henry Horner projects on the west side of Chicago. That's impossible. You think Vietnam is bad? Check the laws. In Vietnam, if you lose one, one son, they allow you to keep the other one. They say, here, here, mother, here, mother dear, hold him, hold him tight. He can stay at home. You understand? If you have two in there and one dies, they'll ship, they'll ship him back. They'll ship him back and get him out the war where there'll be no chance of him dying because miss this war is not going to take both of your sons. And then you're marching on this cruel war in Washington. All you radicals, and what about Miss Soto? Who lost two who lost two sons in one week? That proves to us through the historical fact that Babylon is worse than Vietnam. We need to have some moratorium on black community in Babylon and all oppressed communities in Babylon. And Charles Jackson from, what's that, I'll get, I'll, I'll, who knows where that is? I'll Gale? That's in Chicago. I'll Gale, I'll Gale. I'll Gale Gardens, last week a 14-year-old boy throwing rocks. The pigs told him 
Sound like Tamir Rice. The pigs told him to halt, and the motherfucker shot and murdered him. Murdered him in cold blood. Then you motherfuckers got the nerve to go tramping off to Washington, marching between two dead motherfuckers. The Panther Party is going to criticize you motherfuckers. We going to criticize. Hey, yo, Zulu, man. Yo, bro. Yo, this is how I'll be coming. And you be like, yo, man. Not you, but everybody be like, I'll be coming too hard. Bro, I'm like 50 years too late. All power to the people. <laughs> bro, I'm like 50 years too late calling these motherfuckers motherfuckers. <laughs> Yeah, we gon' we, we gon' criticize you out open because we believe in mass revolutionary criticism. Yo, I'm still in that. We're gonna tell yo the next time I'm yelling at a cop, I'm gonna tell him that I believe in mass revolutionary criticism, bitch. We're gonna tell you that you're wrong because we done had a lot of criticism leveled at us for fucking around with you. You will either be part of the problem or you're gonna be part of the solution. And if we find out you motherfuckers. I like saying that shit. And if we find out you motherfuckers, and if we find out you motherfuckers is part of the problem, we're going to start turning the guns on you crazy motherfuckers. The yeah, the sellouts. We, that the sellouts, your politicians, your local politicians, your local celebrities, these are the people they're talking about. We're going to have some questions and answers. We're going to do one thing too. And, and this is another thing I've cited to show the people where we come from. We come from Babylon. The Black Panther parties ran solely by Black people. If you get a chance, there'll be a big round table discussion that's gonna be on, on for Blacks only. Any, any of you can check the thing and see what it is. And either myself or Shaka will be there. Like really, either me or Shaka will build it, be there. We'll be that's crazy. The Black Panther party. If you get a chance, why don't you look at it? Yo, we're going to be there. We got some events we're going to be at. If me and Shaka, we're going to be there. If you got some questions, come over to the Black Panther table. If you want to do something for me, we'll oh, like okay. do something for Chairman Bobby. If you just clap your hands for me. This is what we call, you don't have to clap too loud. This is what we call the people's beat. It's a beat that was started in 1966 by Huey Newton and Bobby Seal. It's a beat that never stopped because it's the beat they got because they knew it couldn't be stopped. It's the beat that manifests in you, the people. Chairman Bobby Seale says that as long as they're Black people, there'll always be Black Panther Party. They never can stop the party unless they stop the beat. As long as you manifest the beat, we can never be stopped. You think the beat is dangerous? We know it's dangerous because when the beat started, Started out on the West Coast, the chief pig out there, mafioso, um, Alioto, said to the rest of his people that helped him with his fascism out there. He said, listen to those people that, listen to that, listen to those people beat. Hey, they're beating much too fast. Why don't you go back home where they belong? When that beat started last November, a year ago in Chicago, Illinois, at 2350 West Madison, when me and Shaka and Bobby Rush and Che and some more brothers and Jewel got together and said, we're gonna start a Black Panther party right here because this is part of Babylon. The party exists right here too. <laughs> that we might be in school now, might think we're on the mountaintop, but we are gonna come down to the, to the valley because people in the valley um, commitments in the valley, whatever, because people in the valley, commitments in the valley, oppressions in the valley, aggression, repression, fascism, all exist in the valley. No matter how nice it might be on the mountaintop, we've got a commitment. So we're going back. We got to go back to the valley. Yo, that's everybody that moved to the suburbs. Real talk. That's what that means to me. Everybody that moved to the suburbs because they're in the valley now, they're free. They're, you, man, ain't, you're not free unless you go back. You go back to the valley where your people are at, where all those things he's talking about, repression, fascism, all exist in the valley. When we did that, even Daly, I don't doubt Daly, Daly, that was, who was that, the, the mayor of Chicago? All power to the people. Even yeah, Daly, yeah. even Daly and Hanrahan and Judge, we call him Adolf Hitler Huffman, the chief fascist who knows the art of tapista, the art that Mussolini was supposed to have mastered. We say that Hoffman 
is better at the art of Tapista than Mussolini ever was because we know what that art of Tapista is. It's an art of good timing. And when we started that beat, Judge Huffman and Mayor Daly and, and Hammer, Hammerhead, Hanrahan said, hey, listen to the people. It's Chicago. I didn't read this already, right? It's Chicago beat. Politically, they are even beating, beating, beating much too fast. Why don't they go back home to live with all Black people where they belong, to live in dashikis and boo-boos, and to be pork chop nationalists and cultural nationalists? Why don't they go back home to thinking what you're wearing is going to change you? Why don't they go back to political power on flows from the sleeves of a dashiki? And we said, no, as long as that beat continues, we continue because it gives us in the party a type of intoxication that is that it lets us understand we are so revolutionary, proletarian, intoxicated that we cannot be astronomically intimidated. Don't worry about that Black Panther Party. As long as you keep the beat, we'll keep on going. If you think that we can be wiped out because they murdered Bobby Hutton and apprentice Bunchy Carter and John Huggins, Huggins, you're wrong. If you think that because Huey was jailed, the party's gonna stop, you, you see, you're wrong. If you think because Chairman Bobby was jailed, the party's gonna stop, you see, you're wrong. If you think because they can jail me, you thought the party was gone, was gonna stop, you thought wrong. It's, it's 2023, we're here, New African Black Panther Party. They were wrong. Because they, can, because they can enrage Eldridge Cleaver out of the country, you're wrong. Because we said it before, we left and we said it today, that you can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail the revolution. You can lock up a freedom fighter like UEP, UEP Newton, but you can't lock up freedom fighting. You might hire some pork chops like Mama, 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 Mama Lama, <laughs> the murder of Prentice Bunchy Carter, a liberator, but you can't murder liberation because if you do, you come with you come with answers that don't answer, explanations that don't explain, conclusions that don't conclude. We say that if you dare to struggle, then you dare to win. If you did, if you dare not struggle, you don't deserve to win. We wouldn't go into the ring with Muhammad Ali and, and not fight and wonder why we lost, would we? If you, if you don't fight, then you don't deserve to win. If you don't move on these fascists, then you're crazy. We say it's no longer a question of violence or nonviolence. We say it's a question of resistance to fascism or non-existence within fascism. We say, let's stop the war in Vietnam. Let's stop the... Let's stop it by acquiring victory, acquiring victory for the spirit of Ho Chi Minh. We say, let's stop the war in Babylon. Let's initiate the decentralization of the police. The only real thing is the people because pigs bite the hand that feeds them and they need to be slapped. Like Shaka said, when you catch them in your house, hit them with anything. You shouldn't argue about whether to hit them with a chair or a table because they're out of order from the start. We say that the oppressor, fuck Judge Tanny, the oppressor who has no rights, which we, the oppressed, are bound to follow. If you get a chance, come see about Bobby. You ought to come see about Bobby because Bobby came and saw about you. Yo, that's these judges. That's oh, all these judges that are, that, that are ahead of all these um the judicial the ju judicial factories sanctioned to send our children our community away yo i have no faith in none of them i mean and we shouldn't have faith in none of them like they're telling you in 66 they're telling you about these judges not to trust the judges not to trust the papers if you're paying attention if you're listening they're telling you what it is and why it is how it is today you ought to come see about bobby because in 1966 when we didn't even think we were important enough to protect ourselves. Bobby and Huey got their guns and went into the community. They left college. They were pre-engineer students. That was Bobby. And Huey was a pre-law student. That's, you know, that's revolutionary suicide. That's class suicide. They committed class suicide to come 
fight with the on grassroots, with the people on the streets. Oh, power. Oh, yeah. Power. Just imagine that in 1966, how hard do you think it was to be into college? What percentage of Americans or Black people do you think have college degrees or in college now? I'm telling you, it's not what you think. The number, yo, the number of Black people that have college degrees, yo, I doubt it's past 10%. Because I think only like 30, 30 some percent of the country have college degrees. So if you go, if you drop, really go down to Black people, it's, it got to be less than 10%. But, but like at this period, they left college in 66 to go to the on front lines, to go to, the, to these communities, to fight with these people. I mean, like, yo, those are our heroes. I mean, that's who you should be, you should be celebrating, not celebrating all these goofy people that they put out, like who they say, Thurgood Marshall? Thurgood Marshall's everywhere. He's remembered everywhere. Anyway, they were, they were pre-engineered students. That was Bobby, and knew he was pre-law student. And what they read, they put into practice. What they read, what they knew, they put it into practice outside. You ought to come see about Bobby because Bobby came and saw about you. I'm going to see about Bobby. And if you have anything to say, you come see about Bobby. Come down to Jackson and Dearborn and see about our chairman because he's the chairman of Babylon. Don't forget about Mumia. See about Mumia. See about our our, um, our fighters that are All power to the up. people. All yeah. power to the people. Yeah, they locked up right now. See about them. Don't forget them because they fought for you. That's why that's why Mumia is locked up because he was fighting for you. He's the father and the founder of the breakfast programs and the free health clinics. And there's nothing wrong, nothing in the world wrong with that. All power to the people. Power to the people that go here to Northern Illinois University. We say that we need some guns. There's nothing wrong with guns in our community. There's just, there's just been a mis, this misdistribution of guns in our community. For one reason or another, the pigs have all the guns. So all we have to do is equally distribute them. I second that motion. So if you see one that has a gun and you don't have one, then when you leave, you should have one. The way, the way we'll be able to deal with things right. I remember looking at TV and I found that not only did the pigs not brutalize the people in West in on Western days, they had to hire bounty hunters to go arrest them. They shoot somebody with no intention of arresting them. We need some guns. We need some guns. We need some, some force. Thank you. I'm going to call Shaka and Sister Joanne back up here to deal with any questions that you want answered because we have plenty of time to spend. We don't have any time to waste. As the sister said, the time is short. Let's seize the time. Thank you. The, um, Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton, Illinois Chapter Black Panther Party. All power to the people. So all this, power to the people. This class, this class, we have to fit it all in because I don't want to add it on to the next class. Yeah, the class is long. But if anybody got something to say, let's, you know what? Let me show you a video real quick. There's a video on here that the... um. The, no, no, the secretary put on. You said the second slide? I'm going. I got to go all the way back up. But when, when we're talking about putting things in, into practice, when, when the chairman, when our chairman here in the local chat, when we talk, yo, we do police patrol. Like, we're not just saying these things because it's cool to say that's what you're supposed to be doing. Yo, these practices can be done in your communities right now as we speak. Why am I still on? Okay. But this is, I was coming home. I didn't mean to do this. Yo, I was just coming home one day from um, picking up my daughter from school. And when we came home, we saw all these people going into this apartment. All these people, like, no, yeah, yeah. At first, I saw the military. I saw, you know what? Let me slow down. Cause like, I'm trying to speed because we've been here for like two hours now. No, almost two hours. So then, hey, that's why I'm trying to speed. But let me try. Let me slow down. Yo, I came home like around seven, six thirty in the evening. We came home, and as soon as we walked into the complex where we live at, it was about ten armed, um, armed police trucks, whatever. It looked like military vehicles. And then you saw like about 20, 20 or so um, officers with long rifles. And they were inside the community that we live in. So I'm looking and I already know, I understand like these people are not here. There are no violent criminals. There are no big people like that. Like there's no need for all those weapons like you had a war. So I'm going off at the police. As soon as I get on the elevator, somebody tell me, yeah, they're going to Maya apartment. Maya is a young sister about, about four, three, four, five. 
she's about 21 years old. You know, all these police that you see, plus the ones I was talking about down outside, all came to her apartment looking for her. They said that they had a list that she had guns, that she had drugs, she had keys for stolen cars. They said she had all these different things in her apartment. And they came with all those weapons to come arrest that young sister, about 4, 3, 22, 21 years old. You know, they found none of that. None of that was in the apartment. And this video is me walking up to make sure that she was okay in the apartment. But you could see it for yourself. You could see the disdain that the police have for the residents. You know, I'm, I'm about to play the video right now. Man, she know who Af she know Africa. Tell her African head. Nah, man. Y'all good? Y'all good? Y'all good? I'm about to go upstairs. Y'all say y'all good? Because I don't trust this motherfucking pig. Y'all good? All right. I told you I use that motherfucking pig shit. Hey, but look, but look at them. All these people right here, they're inside the apartment. It's more. It's probably it's like if you see three, is you could double that. There's probably six more inside the apartment. And they're in the apartment, they have them on the floor. The, and the, the young lady, Maya, was not there. She was not there, but they still gained access and they never showed their warrant. But they said they were going in that apartment because he had all this stuff in there. They turned the apartment upside down for nothing. But why did they do it? Because the management in the building called them to go in there and do it. And then when they kick, this, this is the this is what the um justification the management of the building is going to use for trying to remove her out of the building so they could gentrify the building. That is their purpose there. But all of this right here is just means to accomplish the capitalist ideas, what they really want to do. So we have to go through this. And if they kill that young lady, they kill her. It doesn't matter. Yeah, shut the fuck up. Don't talk to me like that. Yeah. Oh, no. Nah. They, they said they were good. The young ladies in there said they were good. Even Maya was, because Maya was in there. And then the police officer, like, he, he waved me off. Like, get the fuck out of here. So, like, yo, I love the people, but I have no respect for the pigs. So, like, when he waved his hand at me, yo, it was go time. I mean, and you could hear what I told him. Yeah, shut the fuck up. Don't talk to me like that. Yeah, don't talk to me like that. Let me wave at you. Yeah, Those the police that go inside your apartment and kill you, and they say they came in there as cops. None of them, none of them are on are, 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 are Mataya. None of them. If I saw them on the streets, I wouldn't know. Only that one right there has his badge on his chest. But this is how they assault our communities. And when we read it and we taking these classes, and we just we just heard Fred Hampton. We just heard him saying how we have to police these people. How it doesn't matter if they're black, if they're whatever, they're the ones in our communities oppressing us. This is the video. This video was taken last week. Look at that video. It's brown and black people. I mean, it's not white people kicking down the doors, doing all this oppression to us in 2023. It is these people, people that look like us. And we need to understand that. So if you're saying, what do I need to do? Well, um, what, do they, what do they mean by in practice? Yo, academically, they say you must challenge institutions of power. You must hold them accountable. In practice, this is how it may look when you see them in somebody's apartment about to fuck around and kill somebody. You have to interject and let them know that the people are watching. I mean, that's all I wanted, I wanted to say that before we ended this class. Oh, okay, every, to the people. Everybody here can do something on a daily basis. So all power, yo, anybody want to chime in? Yeah, and, anybody want to say go ahead? 
Um, I wanted to let everybody know if you have any information about what you're doing in your community that you like to showcase, please send it to me. You can send it to Patience Row at Gmail. And like just like we saw on here, we um showcase this video. We can showcase what's going on in your community as well. It doesn't always have to be something like this where we come are confrontational. If you're doing a food program, if you got a video of that, if you're helping pe the homeless people, whatever you're doing in your community, because I think the best way is to showcase the work that we are doing to expose um, pantherism, pa what pantherism is to the community. So please share, share, share. All power to the people. Anybody All power got to some? the people. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say something. Uh, Earlier, when we were uh, when you were discussing in the speech about uh, you know supposedly loving all black people, um, mm -hmm. I know that's a farce because again, you know, black what is it? Black capitalism, black excellence are mythological traps that you know hold us in you know in these cycles and where we think we're going to break out using capitalism or assimilating to the system in quote in quotations. Hold on one second. I, I was talking. Oh, Nick. Oh, Nick. Okay, go ahead. My bad, Nick. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. So, no, no, that's all good, Chairman. I mean, not Jim, Captain. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, what I was going to bring up uh, in the '94 Crime Bill, the Black Caucus was the main, like one of the main, you know, was pushing for it for the '94 Crime Bill. You know, subsequently locking up their, you know, their own kids in a sense, and you know, growing up in 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 Mississippi. Let, in let, 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 let me let me interject. No, not locking up their own kids, locking up our kids. Well, but yeah, those, yeah, because they don't live yeah, in the same true, communities we true. live in. And only reason I said there is because it, it's just in general, of like I, I got you. I get. I was you trying to generalize, but you're right. You're absolutely right. Locking up our folks. Yeah, class. And it's a class there are a lot of where a lot of people, black people now are like, oh yeah, we did that, my bad. It's like, no, you 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 caused a generation of father, fatherlessness almost. And I'm not just saying like, that's the only reason, but just the idea that how black people just wanted a, a solution to the problems that the, you know, Reagan and, and, and Nixon caused all together. They just wanted a solution to it by throwing their own kids in hell. And like me and my wife was talking oh, about okay, it. to the people. It's like, so you rather cast your own children in hell for your peace, for you to still try to assimilate to something that is never for you, like Du Bois said. You 100% correct. And right. it's crazy that even today, like in some of the, you know, Gen Z or some of them, even millennials, because I'm not talking bad, bad about all exes, because I know like half of the exes are boomers follow after the boomers, the other half are like still to themselves drinking and like saying fuck the system or whatever. But you know, you have some millennials, people my age, they're 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 still trying to play into this, well, I can do this, I can make it. And it's like, no, you can't. And that's the reality and it sucks, but we need to come into community together, at least in solidarity and not trying to do unity because unity is not a good idea because that <laughs> unfortunately leads to fashion. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So solidarity is like we all have this common goal that we want to get and we may obtain it, you know, in different methods, but we're still trying to obtain it together. But but the point is, is like you can't root for all black people because we have Clarence Thomas in there who literally is married to a white woman who after the Roe versus Wade said, hey, we're going to look at all these other things. That's going to affect them, like Loving versus, you know, Virginia. Yeah. Nah, all power. Come all on, power. brother. You dropping all power to the people. And so we have to, I, I know I know we say this all the time, I know this is a class, but education to all generations, even for the like the little kids, like the Gen, Gen Alpha, you know, education, even if it's just small drops or whatever. But the point is, I was just trying to say, yeah, we can't love all Black people because all Black people are not for us because those that believe, you know, that they've made it, quote unquote, made it, um, will kick you down if you don't have a certain way about you, if, if, if that makes sense. It makes, a, it makes a whole lot of sense and we see the evidence of it. All power, comrade. You got something, Tristan? Um, yes, thank you. 
Um, I would like to talk about, uh, uh, you know, all of these uh, people who uh, actively choose to work with the system instead of working with the people. And uh, I, I, would, I just want to say that they're all fucking cowards because uh, they saw this system and they, they were just so intimidated by the system that uh, they decided that it would be a better idea to choose to work with the system and take all of their angst out on those who are, or it chose to, they chose the side of the stronger. They were beaten into submission of the stronger system, those who are more powerful than them, and they take it out on those who are weaker than them, who hey, have less power. Hey, Tristan, can I ask you a question? Uh, sure, yeah. All right, so, so yeah, they're cowards, right? Mm -hmm. But then once they get in those positions, and then they try to convince us that what they're doing is moral and just. What what do they become then? Right. I think no, no. that's sociopaths, right? Yeah. Honestly, okay. that's like a there's a psychological concept called uh rationalization yeah. in which a person would conscience consciously try to come up with explanations to the best of their ability for their behavior, even if they don't fully understand their own behavior. All power, all power to the people. All Talk power. to me, Johnny. The interesting points everybody's making. I mean, um, I don't know. I, I feel like there's, so it, it, with respect to, um, you know, institutions, developing institutions or buying property, I know, um, Comrade Africa, you were talking about buying property uh, in the previous session. And then um, in the speech, it talks about, you know, invest, you know, it's just kind of like goes against the revolution. But then is I, I'm, this is a question or just a, maybe a rhetorical question. Yeah. And that um, if we're buying property uh, for liberation causes is one thing. Uh, whereas if we're buying property to flip and just to continue flipping property, under this guise of, um, you know, activism or revolution, activism or revolutionary. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it, it's it's false. Um, so but, like, but, but but before you continue, like you could, yeah. you, could, you could easily see the difference because in yeah. the Panthers it says cooperatives. It I was going to say, yeah, it is. I was like, gonna, come it, up. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. My bad. I probably stole your thunder. My bad, my boy. Go ahead. No. I was going to say, uh, if, if, if you're talking about collectives or cooperatives, um, schooling, right, schooling uh, programs where after school programs and it's a people's thing like uh, where it can be. I, I don't know, like it, it could be funded. Some of these things or like um, uh, the taste, you know, where people who age out of. Um, the foster care system have nowhere to go. So oh, if you're wow. you, you're using government funding to create some form of uh, stability for a generation who um, would otherwise be definitely cast into the lumpen, uh, you know, there's maybe the intention is is well. I don't know. I'm just saying. Uh, another thing we were talking about is uh, I, I like to, you can't you can't. You, you got to talk about changing racist with a gun or a punch. Uh, I like that, but it, 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 I, I do, I like that. And at the same time, I've had the experience of being in, in situations with people who come into where we are as racists. And then with a certain amount of pers uh, sp perspective or knowledge, uh, it, they change their outlook. And it's few and far between, like, especially when there's a stronghold of, of um, Indoctrination. Indoctrination, no, but, but more than that, the stronghold of, of uh, peer pressure. Mm. It's Whereas when people come into a situation where they're willing to accept something something new, where they're willing to see that that belief system that they had was the same belief system that, thought, that made them think it was good to have a needle in their arm, right? As a reward, as part of the privilege of our freedom, right? That's what we get for hard work is drinking beer and, and, and doing dope. That's our reward. Like when you, then things start to like. There's some momentum that picks up when when people are willing to accept that information. Uh, and then the other thing I was going to say is, um, I think there are 
Oh, yeah. That, th those were the two main points I was going to talk about. Those hey, yo, were the two. You know what I'm happy about? Yeah. But you took them motherfucking notes, my guy. <laughs> yeah. Nah, like real talk, like you took them notes. That showed me like you paying attention, like you interested. Like for Absolutely. real. Hey, I'm digging that. So what else you got on that paper, on that notepad? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. No, I was just saying the last thing I was going to read is I think there are some who are willing to, uh, willing as soon as, oh, and there are some people who are going to hold up. This was a, the last point. There are some people who are going to hold on to that shit until the revolution takes place and then join the interests of the people. But until then, they're going to abuse the privilege for survival in the meantime, which is a, it's the major contradiction. It's yeah. almost like how can it's almost like it's not possible to do. But their ideology is like right on the cusp of being willing like they are willing, but hey, there's nothing happening, so I got to get mine. And like people say the same thing, but like I feel like once you jump into the, uh, I, I just I don't know, this might be might be wrong, but to a certain extent it's true. Once you jump into the uh, boots of a revolutionary, you kind of give away some of the privilege that would have been uh, available to me, you know, uh, with what's this up? with Glass this shade. What's up? Yeah, that's what's up. All power. Good good points there. Good points, Johnny. Hey, Rob, what's up? Rob, what you got for me? Rob Rich, the right Rob? <laughs> um, all power to the people. I just wanted to say real quick um, that revolution is a class struggle. God damn it. <laughs> I just wanted to all put, power to the people. All God power damn to it. The people. I wanted to all put power to the people. All power. I just want to put emphasis on that. We were actually talking about this the other day, uh, Africa and I, and patience. And, patience. Um, and I think that, and the reason I brought that up, that part of the speech was because somebody said, when's the revolution going to start? And I'm like, shit, it already started. What, the, what are you waiting for? And the reason why I said that is based off of what was just said in there. And I think that people don't really think a revolution or these things are, are meaningful certain things that you could do like these uh they may be small uh they may someone may not even know about it but these are anything in which when you take part of that is a class struggle that's in favor of the proletariat that's revolutionary oh, wow. and that's what I think that some people get it misconstrued like it's only revolutionary like after the fact. Like, let's look back and look at say what happened in Cuba and be like, oh, these things were revolutionary because there was a success and uh, seizing the state, you know, and uh, stuff like that. And then it's like, it's not it's not that looking back and, and, and being able to uh, analyze it that, it's everything that we do now, like uh, Comrade Bethune, when we started thinking like that, uh, uh, what Mao talks about with him, when he was just, uh, was he a medic or something like that? And these little things yeah. that that con he contributed were what helped levy revolutions forward. So it's these small things and everything isn't going to look like that of uh, uh, the Red Guards or it's not going to look like that of like, you know, a guerrilla warfare. It's not going to look like sometimes it just, it's the simplest things like art that mean the, the biggest things and that, that help that struggle. And someone, someone who tell me that the revolution hasn't begun, well, I'll say <laughs> there sure as hell is a lot of counter revolution going on. So for that to exist, all we know. To the people. The <laughs> and that's all I had to say about that. All power to the people. Hey, all, all power, power, all power. All power to the people, all power. Nah, you hit it, you hit it right on the, on the head. It's a lot of, we talked about it a couple of days ago. It's a lot of counter -re revolutionary shit going on. So how the hell it ain't gonna be no revolution going on? People just need to join it. I mean, but um, I think we're gonna be watching this video next week. This is um Comrade Kwame. I'm about to hit play on here. Let's see what he's talking about. With the original Black Panther Party still for and how some of this stuff I'm gonna read today or even applies today. It says this is a dialogue in our community. This is a dialogue in our community, continuing discussion of the new thrust of the Black Panther Party as we began to carry out the original vision of the party. When we coined the expression, all power to the people, we had in mind emphasizing the word power. For we recognize that the will, of the, uh, the will to power is the basic drive of man, but it is incorrect to seek power over people. 
we have been subjected to the dehumanizing power of exploitation and racism for hundreds of years. And the black community has its own will to power also. What we seek, however, is not power over people, but the uh, power to control our own destiny. For us, the true definition of power is not in the terms of how many people you can control. To us, power is, first of all, the ability to define phenomena, and secondarily, and secondly, the ability to make these, uh, this, these phenomena act in a desired manner. Uh, people just tuning on, this is a uh, reading from the Huey P. Newton Reader, uh, edited by David Hilliard and Donna Wise. This is part of the political education I'm going to start doing for now on for the community. Uh, and uh, we read from uh, uh, something that he wrote called Black Capitalism Reanalyzed One. Uh, he wrote this June 5th, 1971. Yeah, so look, check that video out. And next week when we come, we're going we're going to check the rest of the um, talk about what, what he said on there. But look, all power to the people, y'all. Look, um, it's going to be a rough week tomorrow. If you got any issues, hit that group chat. You'll hit me up on my phone, whatever you're going through. If you're doing anything out there, Hey, yo, try to get some video and send it to us so we could talk about it on, um, talk about it here. We could make time, make space to talk about what we are doing in the community. I said all, all power, power to, the, to people. the people. All power, all to, power, the power people. to the people. All power, all power, power to the people. All 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 power to the people.